Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to the Marketing Club's third Business Etiquette Seminar. This seminar is on telephone, email, and electronic media etiquette. And uh, so we're going to be uh, talking about a lot of different things tonight. So the first thing I might like to ask you is to turn off your cell phones, uh, to, um, you know, not... Uh, to not go through uh, email and uh, that kind of thing and texting while we're uh, talking about that tonight. So uh, before I begin, I would like to tell you about some of my sources uh, for this seminar. And uh, uh, one source uh, that is, was very instructive is this new book that's out. It's the official book of electronic etiquette. Uh, but I think some of you probably are familiar with blogs and uh, you know where better to find sources of information about etiquette related to electronic media, then blogs, cellphones.org, Microsoft Small Business, but also there is a gentleman by the name of Eric Brantner, Jennifer Mattern, and Chris Brogan, who all have some very good websites on uh, all this electronic media etiquette. So, uh, if, and if you would like more information, you can certainly check out those websites. So what I'm going to do is start talking first about telephone etiquette. I'll talk in general about um, telephone etiquette, and then I'll talk a little bit about cell phone etiquette and smartphone etiquette. So uh, suppose you're in an office, because a lot of this is on business etiquette related to these various media. Uh, so uh, we're going to first talk about uh, the telephones in the office. So as uh, marketing people or business people, if uh, your phone rings in the office, uh, you don't want to sit and finish what you're doing. Um, you want to answer by the second ring. Um, it shows you're eager uh, to help people, that you are eager to talk with people. So um, that is a good practice and a goal to set for yourself. Don't have the facial expressions and body language that you would like to have to be able to read other people. So you need to compensate when you're on the phone with your, with your voice to express yourself. So your voice modulation, your pitch, your rate of talking can tell people how enthusiastic you are, how eager you are to help them, uh, you know, how uh, pleased you are with their call. All right, so now you're going to be phoning someone. And uh, so the, they answer the phone, hello, my, uh, you know, at the one end they say hello, and you say, well, um, is so-and-so there? All right, so the first thing really in telephone etiquette is that you have to identify yourself. So, yes, my name is so-and-so, and I'm with this company, and I would uh, like to speak with so-and-so, uh, please. Uh, so identify yourself when calling, but also when answering. So if your phone rings at your desk at work, you know, you pick it up, you say, good afternoon, my name is, or this is, and this in, the, in a certain department that you're in. Uh, so, and... Um, the reason why you would say good afternoon or uh, thank you for calling, my name is, it gives people a chance to get ready to hear your name. So that little bit of a prelude to your name is very important so people will pay attention to that. Uh, so suppose you're phoning someone and uh, they answer and you've gone through all the introductions. Um, the, a nice thing to do, good etiquette, is to ask people if this is a good time to talk. To, uh, to call them. And if not, you ask them if it's a more convenient time. So that's a very thoughtful thing to do. And you may find that when you've called someone, they're in the middle of something. So it's a, you know, it's a very nice thing to do when you're calling other people. All right, so if you call a wrong number, should you just hang up? No, especially with everybody having caller ID now, you may get a call back from them. So they answer, you realize it's a wrong number, you need to apologize, sorry, I have the wrong number. Um, and you know, maybe you have the wrong number and you don't have a correct number. So sometimes it's best to ask what number you dialed if they'll tell you that. Or ask them, you read the number you called and ask them if that is the number you actually dialed. So you can figure out whether you have a wrong number or not. Uh, so answering machine, voicemail or taking messages etiquette. Uh, so you call me on my, on my phone, I'm not there, you get my voicemail message, and um, how long of a message should you leave? Well, definitely less than two minutes, yes. A lot of messages only have about 30 to 45 seconds, so you certainly don't wanna go on and on and on and ramble. Uh, so 
you want to leave a brief message, you want to leave your name, you want to say it clearly. If you have an unusual name, you should spell it. Um, if you give your phone number, which you should, you should repeat it twice and slowly and also request a reply if that's what you would like them to do. Uh, so very important because uh, you know how many times if you received a message you can't understand the person, you can't hear their name, you don't know how to spell it, and they said their phone number once and you didn't get one number in the phone number. So very important. Um, and another thing you can do in your voicemail message is if people are calling you and if uh, if they if they know um, you know what extension they want, give them a shortcut uh, so they can bypass the voicemail message and go right to a leaving a message. So, you know, on our campus, if you hit star, you can skip the voicemail message and just leave a message. And on other systems, it might be the pound sign. So that's something very nice to include in your voicemail message. All right, so suppose someone is calling uh, and you answer, and they say, well, you know, I, I would like to speak to so-and-so. Um, and so one of the things you should say at your end is, may I tell her or him who's calling, please? Or may I ask uh, what this is in reference to? So, uh, you know, instead of saying, who's this? Or what's it about? You know, you want to say it in a very tactful way. So may I ask who's calling? May I tell him or her what this uh, call is about? Is a very nice and tactful way to do it. So suppose you're transferring someone. Someone calls you and you figure they should be speaking with someone else, so you need to transfer the call. Should you simply transfer the call or should you do something else? You probably should tell them what number you're transferring them to because sometimes when you, when you try to transfer, you get disconnected and now they're gonna have to call you back to figure out you know, who they should have been transferred to. So it's a very polite thing to, to tell people, okay, I'm transferring you to this person at this number. If you'll write it down, please, just in case we're disconnected. Um, that way you can call them back directly. All right, so uh, another thing that we find uh, people don't do very often is update their voicemail uh, when they've gone away. So you call someone, it's Wednesday, and their voicemail message says, hello, uh, this is so-and-so, I'll be away from now until Sunday, I'll return on Monday, and um, you can reach me then. All right, so it's Wednesday, and they haven't changed their voicemail message yet. So you want to remember to do that. You, before you go away, you should probably leave yourself a note to remind yourself to update the voicemail message before you go away. Um, a good... A uh, thing to do, a good practice, is to rec return phone calls within 24 hours. And I know some people probably would prefer people return phone calls within a couple of hours. But, um, you know, one day or 24 hours is, uh, is not a bad goal to set for yourself. You can set more ambitious goals if you want. But that is one that's uh, very, very common. All right, so suppose we like using the speaker phone, because then we don't have to hold the phone in our hand or anything. So uh, what, w what should we do before we use the speaker phone when we're talking with other people? Tell them or ask their permission. Do you mind if I put you on speaker phone? Because that means other people could be in the room. And I, you know, I've talked with people who, who say, I put the person on speaker phone so we could all hear how incredibly annoying that person was or whatever. So it's not a good thing to do and you don't want to have people laughing in the background if you do it. But you must ask permission before you put people on speakerphone. Um, and also the same thing goes for putting people on hold. So if you want to put someone on hold, again, um, I, would, would you mind if I put you on hold? And if they have some urgent thing going on, they will tell you that yes, they do mind and they prefer you not to do that. All right, so uh, if you're on a conversation and uh, the call is dropped or the call is disconnected in some way, who should call back? Who should call back? Any guesses? The person who, called. The person who made the original call, because you know they have the phone number of the other person. The person who was called doesn't necessarily have the phone number of the person who made the call. So definitely the original caller should call back. All right, so uh, have you ever been on a long conversation with someone and you're talking and you don't hear anything on the other end? 
and you're still talking, and maybe you were disconnected, but you didn't know it because you didn't hear anything on the other end. So a good practice also is if you're talking with someone um, and you're talking for quite a while, it's a very good thing if they would um, use affirming voices or sounds um, to let you know they're listening. So um, that might be, uh-huh, or yes, I understand, or I see, or that's a good point, or something like that, so people know you're listening, that they're not just talking um, to thin air. All right, so uh, you're in an office now. You've got someone who's really angry who calls you. And, uh, you know, how do you handle the angry person? You know, our impulse would be um, to get kind of stern or angry or short with them back again. Uh, but in marketing especially, if you have an angry customer, you really have to show some empathy. Um, you have to let them know you're listening because that's the one thing people want. They want to be heard. They want to air their grievance. Um, and uh, and you know, marketing um, theory says that if you uh, listen to someone who's complaining, you can win them over and then you, they will be a more loyal customer and they'll tell other people how nicely you handled their complaint. So uh, when uh, people are angry and they're calling, you listen, um, you tell them you know, that you would like to write down the information that they're giving you, ask them to slow down. So when people are angry, you know, asking them to slow down kind of slows the whole thing down a bit. And so uh, tell them it's important what they're telling you, that you would like to get it all done correctly, that you'll have someone, a manager, return the call. and. Um, talk with them further and so um, and then you have to make sure you follow through on that so uh, don't rile up angry callers try to calm them down listen to them and let them know that what they're telling you is important and being heard all right so another thing and we've all had this too uh, you call someone and they are talking to you or they're listening to you but in the background you're hearing the keyboard going uh, so you know they're typing, uh, you know, or you know, doing email or something while you're talking to them. So that definitely is one of those rude things that you don't want to do. So don't multitask, you know, while uh, you're on the phone with someone. Another um, tip that salespeople have used for years on telephones is they're, uh, they smile when they're on the phone. And sometimes they stand up when they're on the phone because you have more energy when you stand up, but when you smile, um, you have a different frame of mind, and it comes through in the phone call uh, very clearly. So, um, so smiling is a good way to project, uh, you know, a, a nice um, uh, personality, to, personality to the person on the other end of the phone. And the things that you shouldn't do, of course, are things like chewing gum or eating. Uh, you know, or, or uh, I have a, I have one friend who coughs into the phone when uh, we're on the phone, and it really is magnified. And so you need to make sure your mouth is away from the phone so you're not uh, coughing into someone's ear. Okay, so what are the hours that we should call people generally? What are the acceptable hours of calling people? You know, whether it's for business or even uh, if, you know, for telemarketing or marketing research, what are, what's the earliest do you think you should call people in the morning? Nine o'clock is correct, how about at night? Well, for business, probably five or six, but um, in general, nine o'clock is the cutoff point. You don't want to call people after nine, and nine is too late for some people, so you want to be careful about that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about cell phones now. We've talked in general about telephones, but cell phone etiquette is another thing all by itself. So you tell me, what's the most annoying thing about people using their cell phones? They've done research on it, and there's one thing that stands out above all other things. Talking too loudly. Right? Exactly, that's it. So people are, you know, in public, they're talking on the phone, they're talking so loud, you're hearing their whole conversation. And, and you don't want to hear their conversation. So that is the number one complaint about cell phone usage. Uh, so, uh, so one study showed that 92% of the people wished that others would be more polite about using their cell phones. Um, but the other thing that the research showed is that we've become a little more tolerant of people using their cell phones. So a lot of times we didn't want to see people using their cell phones in public or in a building or somewhere, but I think that we've become a lot more tolerant of people using their cell phones. 
Why? Because we ourselves break the rules sometimes, so we're kind of understanding when other people do it. All right, so there's a, there is an amount of space that you may want to have around you when you're using your cell phone. Can you think how many feet it might be would be a good, safe distance from other people when you're using your cell phone so people can't hear everything you're saying? How many feet? Ten feet. Ten feet. Uh, so ten feet, the ten foot proximity rule is what it's been called. And uh, so that's a, a good distance to be uh, away from other people at. So, you know, why do people talk loud on the cell phone? Do they think they're not going to pick up their voice? Well, one of the, the uh, tips that one expert gave was that if you turn your cell phone volume for you to be able to hear other people, if you turn it all the way up, then you can hear clearly, and maybe you're not going to yell so loud into the cell phone yourself. Uh, so lower your, uh, your, your speaking volume, but raise the volume of incoming calls so that you don't feel like you've got a bad connection or something. Um, so you're having a, a conversation uh, with another person, and your phone rings. Uh, so what do you do? So the, the important thing is you really should avoid taking a cell phone call when you're having a face-to-face -face conversation with somebody else. You should also avoid texting with other people when you're having a face-to-face -face conversation with someone else. Now, if you really have an important phone call that you're expecting, one of the things that you should do is let the person know in advance that I'm expecting an important phone call, which I really must take. So while we're talking, my phone may ring, and I may have to break off our conversation for a short period of time. Uh, so, so that would be the very polite thing to do in terms of uh, taking a call or texting when you have a face-to-face -face conversation. All right, so we've all used our cell phones. And we're talking, and the other person is talking, and there's a little bit of delay in cell phone um, uh, messages. Uh, so uh, you want to be a little patient and um, make sure you've heard the other person and given them a chance to speak before you, you speak as well uh, because of that delay in the phone technology. All right, so where are some places where you should never use your cell phone? Can you think of any? Elevator. Elevator. Because it's way too close, but people do. But where else? How about in uh, places of worship? People do, but they shouldn't. Okay, where else? It could be a hospital. Hospitals, especially like in emergency rooms, but in other places of the hospital, they may have signs telling you not to use your cell phone. Where else? Restaurants, it's quite annoying, and there are some restaurants which will ask you to check your cell phone at the door or to turn it off to, to make sure that their other guests are not uh, offended or bothered by your conversation. Okay. Funeral homes would be another place where it would be good not to use your cell phone. You don't want to use it in movie theaters or in other darkened rooms or in business meetings. You want to make sure your cell phone is off or... Uh, at least on vibrate. Um, so uh, another thing that you uh, want to uh, not do is you're having a conversation on the phone and uh, you know the phones uh, you can do more than one thing on your cell phone now right or your smartphone so you shouldn't be on your phone while you're surfing the internet uh, you know because you can do that right. Uh, so don't look up things on your smartphone while you're on a conversation, unless you know the person is asking you to check on something while you're on a conversation. Uh, also, your ringtones. You know, there, I have been in all kinds of meetings where people's uh, phones have rung, and the ringtone is you know some embarrassing song that they wish they didn't have on there. And uh, you know, I know I was in uh, Sam's Club, and my phone rang. My husband had had changed uh, the uh, ringtone. Um, to a dog barking. So I was looking all over, you know, where's the dog barking coming? It was coming from my purse. So, um, all right, so uh, again, you don't want to uh, use your cell phone while you're conducting business. So, I mean, the thing that most people complain about is in the grocery store, the checkout line, someone's on the cell phone while they're being asked to pay, you know, for their food and uh, that kind of thing. But also while you're doing your banking or in the ATM line, and why, what's another reason why we don't like to see people in an ATM line using their smartphones in particular? We don't want them like 
you know, taking a picture of us putting in our, you know, um, PIN number or something like that. So uh, doing your banking in store in a business meeting, definitely not using your cell phone. So the whole world, you know, uh, I read this online today. It was quite interesting. The whole world is not your personal phone booth. So you don't want to use cell phones in, uh, you know, the various places that I've mentioned. Um, uh, you know, funeral homes, houses of worship, museums, libraries, doctor's offices, emergency rooms, theaters, restaurants, other enclosed places. Okay, so uh, we're going to change the subject now and go to email etiquette. You know, I've given many over the years, I've given several um, seminars on email marketing. And a lot of the rules for email marketing are very similar to email etiquette. Uh, so the one thing everybody should know is if you're working at a job and you're doing email, your employer owns your email. So if you think it's private in your place of work, it's not. So they can always look at your email. They will get your password and they can look at your email. So you want to be very uh, you know, circumspect about what you use email for at work. Um, so um, the other day I got this joke. Uh, in the, an email from somebody who works here at the college who I don't know very well. And it was a little bit of an off-color email uh, joke. And so I think what happened is uh, she may have, um, you know, my, came to me, but I think it was meant for somebody else. So when you go to your email uh, list of people directory and you're going down and you're finding someone to send to, when people have a similar name, Sometimes you type in the first few letters of the name and some name pops up and you think it's the person you're sending it to and it's somebody different and they get your email and then you get a message back from them that says, I don't think you meant this to come to me. I think you might have meant it for somebody else. So be careful when you're picking up, uh, you pick the right email out of your address book. Um, when you're emailing people, you want to always make sure you've got your name and address as, uh, you know, how they can re return your email. It's best to actually use the subject line. It's a smart thing to do. So a lot of people use a, sub, you know, use a blank subject line, but I think it's much better to let people know what the subject of your email is about. So um, that's what it's for. So don't leave it blank. And then, uh, you know, there's a salutation. You know, like if you wrote a letter by hand, um, you would probably write a salutation. And that is the line where it's dear, Mary or dear John, that kind of thing. So in an email, you know, I know we're tempted and for your friends, if they email you, you can just email back an answer. But for business correspondence by email, you should use a salutation. So dear so-and-so, you know, by their name, whatever it happens to be. Um, uh, because that's a much more polite way of starting an email message than just, you know, um, saying hey or you know just responding to their email so um, use a salutation address people by name okay so here are some things you know texting has uh, in some cases kind of ruined communication between people so in emails you want to spell words out you uh, want to punctuate things which a lot of people are dropping punctuation you want to use complete sentences not you know phrases and you want to use paragraph form. You know, all the stuff you learned in grade school about writing. So spell words out, punctuate, use complete sentences, use paragraphs. Don't use all lowercase because, you know, then you're not using proper rules of uh, punctuation. And, um, and don't use all uppercase because what's uppercase do? All capital letters. Well, some people call it flaming or, you know, so it's uh, the email equivalent of shouting. Um, and don't use too much punctuation. So too much punctuation is, you know, like 10 exclamation points in a row or, you know, six question marks. Uh, because if, and especially if you use that in the subject line, it may be perceived or read by an internet service provider as, um, as spam. So you certainly don't want to be read as spam. Uh, so uh, suppose you're forwarding something. Someone has sent you this funny joke and it's been forwarded six times. So you've got the messages from six people when they forwarded it to whoever they were forwarding to. So um, when you forward that joke for the seventh time, make sure you delete all the other forwarding messages and just forward 
the joke and leave all that other stuff off. It just kind of clogs up people's uh, email boxes with, um, with more volume than they need. Okay, so, um, you know, we all forward jokes. We all forward funny things and stories. Um, and so it is okay to forward jokes that have been floating around the internet, but suppose uh, someone uh, develops a, a story or something on the internet or an article on the internet that you, someone you know, um, and before you forward that to other people, you should ask their permission. So, uh, so that's a very important point. You know, you don't want to keep forwarding everything. You should ask people's permission before you forward it. Um, okay, so hijacked emails. You know, yesterday I got um, a, a message from our former dean, and I uh, looked at it, and it was um, a link to some sexy website. So um, anyway, so I, e I emailed him back, and I said, I, th I think maybe your email's been hijacked. So that happens sometimes, right? Somebody kind of gets into your email and sends, you know, either business or, you know, sexy kind of emails to people on your, in your address book that, um, that you really don't want other people sending email to. So you want to report that to your internet service provider as soon as possible so that that can be taken care of. All right. So now another thing, I've been sending emails to students and I want to let them know that uh, about today's uh, seminar and also tonight's marketing club meeting. So I sent an email and I said, uh, you know, we're having this seminar today and then I put slash Tuesday so they know, you know, if they read the email tomorrow, they'll know it, it's not tomorrow that it was today. So use care in making reference to certain days of the week in your email because people don't always read it the same day you send it. Um, and also um, if, you're, if you do a lot of international uh, email, avoid using numbers for days and months. So, you know, here in, in the U.S., we um, tend to put the month and then the day, uh, but in uh, Canada and other places in Europe, they put the day first and then the month. So uh, you don't want to confuse people. So you can spell out the month and day. Um, all right. So some things, uh, you know, when you're emailing people, uh, sometimes when they receive it, they don't receive it in the same format as you send it. So you want to be really careful about some things. So if you try to indent, sometimes indents or tabs don't translate well on the other end. That people don't get it in the same format that you sent it. Sometimes if you use some exotic fonts, not all computers can read those fonts. They might get changed to a more common uh, font. And even if you use a background, a color background, or some kind of patterned background, sometimes they don't uh, translate well uh, when uh, they are received on the other end. Um, so uh, attachments, uh, you know, if, if someone sends you an email with an attachment, um, when you're sending it to other people, you should ask uh, their permission to send, uh, send something with an attachment. And you say, well, why would I do that? Well, the thing is, a lot of times we get emails with attachments and we're afraid to open them because we're not sure what's in the attachment. So by getting their permission in advance, they will tend to understand that it's probably a safe attachment to open up. So before you send emails, you know, there are you know, important things that you want to proofread your email for spelling, for grammatical, for punctuation errors. And you know, sometimes we're so busy, we're, you know, we're writing our response and we hit the send button and then, and then we read it after we send it and we say, oh, it's got these errors in it. So you certainly uh, have to take your time. And I know myself, a lot of times I'll respond to an email. The first thing I'll do is write the response. Then I'll go back up to the top and I'll write dear so-and-so, so I'm a little more polite. Um, and then I read it over because I make, there are certain mistakes I make a lot. In the, a lot of times I write your instead of you, and so I always have to go back and look for something like that. So and sometimes you, miss, you, you, you leave out words, so you want to make sure you've read those before you send them out. And you know, it's not so important when you're emailing your friends, but in a business setting, you want to make sure you have the very highest standards of communication when you're communicating with business partners, with customers, with clients. So that's important. All right, so. Suppose you're sending to a large group of people, 
Uh, and so instead of having 30 names in the two, on the two line where everybody can see everybody else's email address, what should we use instead of every, putting everybody's email on the two line? The BCC, right, which stands for blind carbon copy. So you've probably never seen a carbon copy, but those are, um, in the olden days, uh, you used a piece of carbon paper and you put a piece of paper under your letter and it would produce a second copy of something. So a blind copy is when the people who are getting it don't know who else is getting the email. And uh, that way you're, you're protecting the privacy of the other people you're sending the email to. It also can sometimes fool um, internet providers because uh, you know if you are sending to a big group of people like 30 or 40 people um, on the other end the internet service provider may perceive you to be a spammer and uh, because they can see all these emails but sometimes if you send it as a blind carbon copy with all, everybody's emails there then it may not be perceived as a, a spam so that's a very good thing uh, to use so uh, you know with email you can uh, program in your signature, right? So you can, so you don't have to keep writing, you know, your your name and uh, you know the company you work for, your position title, your phone number, your email, your fax number, um, and uh, you know a tagline or whatever. So um, you can program in those signatures, so you don't have to keep writing it, uh, but you don't want it too long. I have a great friend. But he has a signature that's about this long at the end of his emails. So he's got like 10 different quotes and uh, you know, it goes on and on. So that's too long really. Um, you know, one quote would be nice and it would be even nicer if you change it now and then so people get a little variety when they get a message from you. Um, and the best advice is about when you get an email that makes you angry or uh, just upset with someone uh, you should always wait to respond. Uh, so don't even write a response until maybe the next day. And then you write your response, and then you wait a little longer and read it over. Let somebody else read it over. And the best thing that you might do is just delete it entirely and deal with that person maybe face to face and uh, in a different way. OK, so the last topic for today is uh, the social media and blogging etiquette. And so uh, this is where I see a lot of problems uh, for the future of people. Um, you know, it's kind of like uh, you're a student and, you know, uh, you know this, a student's life is different from somebody out in the workplace. Uh, but you do want to make sure uh, that it uh, doesn't create embarrassing situations for you in the future. So, well, first of all, you want to keep your profile updated. Um, and whether, no matter what kind of social media it is, you want to make sure that you're adding value to whatever conversation you're participating in. And uh, if you stay positive, um, then you really can't go wrong. You know, uh, I, I remember there was a, a faculty member in the school of business. What a nice person. He never said a bad thing about anybody. He was just so calm and pleasant, always smiling. Everybody loved him. And he never got in any trouble at all. Uh, but you know, there are other people you know, who speak up, and uh, there's nothing wrong with that either. But you know, by staying positive, uh, you'll, you'll tend to uh, be perceived a lot more positively. OK, so easy on the updates in terms of your know, Facebook page or your Twitter or whatever. People don't care about every meal you eat uh, or everything you do every minute of the day. Right, so you know, take it easy. We don't have to hear from you know your friends, you know, every half an hour on the hour. Um, now, the the one of the m most important things is about the pictures that our people are putting up on Facebook and on other um, sites. So you don't want to put pictures or videos on YouTube that you'll be ashamed of later. So you're going to say, okay, well, you know, I can take it down. I can you know, always remove it from my website. But what about the people who've already downloaded it onto their hard drive? And you're running for office someday and uh, someone pulls out this video that you did 10 years ago in an embarrassing situation. You always have to think about, would I like to see this on the front page of the newspaper? Or would I like to see this on the six o'clock news? Because if you would not, you, you really should not post it on, on your uh, Facebook page or uh, on a blog. 
So um, photos that you put up should really strengthen your image. And I know there's Facebook, which is more social, and then there's LinkedIn, which is much more professional. Um, but uh, you still have to think about it even with Facebook. You know, I have a, a dear former student who is back in his home country, and he writes all the time about how he's going out and drinking and getting drunk and doing this and that. And I said, you know, you really shouldn't be putting this on Facebook, you know, especially if, you know, you want a good job. Uh, you know, somebody sees this, you're in trouble. And in the news recently, there was a teacher, you know, who uh, you know, had a Facebook picture. She was having a drink. And, uh, you know, really they asked for a resignation. And um, it's a really sad situation when that happens. So any uh, status updates you do on your page should be very professional. Um, you also don't want to post questionable photos of other people on your pages uh, without their permission. So uh, yeah, it's uh, very important that you, uh, you know, not embarrass other people as well. And you, know, you want to try to use a good picture on your Facebook page. Um, some people use avatars. Some people you know, use pictures from when they were 10 years old. Um, but you know, try to use a, a picture that is a, a decent picture of yourself. Um, you also, on, the, uh, on Facebook or other uh, social networking websites, shouldn't badmouth individual people or your current employer or your past employers. Uh, because um, you know, people don't want to read about that either, and it can get you in a little bit of hot water. You know, um, sometimes you think you've, you've uh, put privacy or you've, uh, you've only allowed certain people to access your Facebook page, but sometimes people don't understand it and anybody can access it and then they're very embarrassed by who's been able to see what on their Facebook page. So the one thing you know, I would say about social media online is the same um, courtesies that you provide to people fa in face-to-face -face situations uh, should be also done online. Sometimes the fact that it's a little more anonymous online gives people a little more courage to be bold and rude and obnoxious, and you, you certainly don't want to do that. So uh, the same social skills that are helpful in face-to-face -face relationships are also valuable in the social media. Uh, one last thing about general social media, and that is uh, there are social media stalkers who, um, if, uh, if somebody they are interested in is on uh, you know, three different social media sites and on other um, sites that they follow them and all the different areas that they're on. And um, so that is, I wouldn't recommend that. Okay, so regarding uh, blogging and Facebook and MySpace, that kind of thing, um, the experts all say you want to give more than you receive. And um, in terms of blogging or you know writing things on Facebook about other people. They say you want to say nice things about other people or promote other people more than yourself. A lot of people use Facebook uh, or uh, blogs or um, Twitter to promote themselves, their businesses, their you know whatever they're in. Um, and uh, the experts are saying you should use a 12 to 1 ratio. Say, say 12 nice things about other people while you're promoting yourself one time. Um, because there is a kind of professional courtesy in the blogging business and in the social networking business that uh, if you promote someone else's blog and provide a link to it, then they may also do the same thing for you. So by saying nice things about 12 other people, you may see that come back to you. It's a, the old karma thing. Um, Another thing about social networking is that it's social. And so, but there are people who use social networks as their like one-on-one uh, -on -one kind of communication uh, venue. So you don't want to keep everything private. Um, you don't want to just email, you know, direct to one person all the time. You don't want to just text to one person all the time. You don't want to instant message with, you know, individuals one at a time. Social networking is for social networking, which means you're reaching more than one person at the same time. Now, suppose uh, you know, you're on your Facebook page and uh, it's your birthday today, right? So what happens on your birthday on Facebook? You know, if your birth birthday's posted and everybody knows it and now you're gonna get 20 messages from people wishing you a happy birthday. 
So the question is, do you have to respond to all 20 people individually? So there's a, a, you know, a comment by one person wishing a happy birthday. Do you have to say thank you? And then another one posts, do you have to say thank you? What do you think? No, you don't have to. Um, so, uh, you know, you can do kind of a group thank you after a couple days, you know, and thank everybody all at once. But it's not necessary to respond to every comment on your Facebook page and thank them or, you know, whatever. Um, so if you're talking about, you know, an expert in your blog post, um, you, and if you provide a link to that expert, that's often a very nice thing for you to do. And if you refer to them as an, you know, an expert uh, blogger on this topic, it's even a nicer thing to do. Um, now, uh, you know a lot of blogs usually have a, a button for sharing, for tweeting, for liking, for stumbling, you know, whatever. Um, somewhere there's a button for that. And they're there for a reason. And if you like an article, then you should push the button. And, um, and they referred to it in one uh, article as like a tip jar for an artist that, um, you know, they're writing, they're, those blogs, they're writing for free. Um, and the thing that they would like to know is whether people who are reading it find it um, interesting or helpful in some way. Uh, so uh, one, uh, we read about some of the uses that people make of blogs and sometimes uh, you'll hear a discussion about something and, um, uh, so first thing, it's not good to go after a competitor and um, try to get them banned from a site or say nasty things about competitors on a blog. Um, you can respond to their content, but it's not good to go after them in a stealth fashion. Um, it's also not good to create multiple names or handles or accounts. So it looks like different people are either promoting some cause or speaking negatively about some company or product. So, um, and that happened, I think, um, I think it was Whole Foods that actually um, had anonymous people who worked for the company were, were making statements on blogs about Whole Foods that were, you know, positive statements. So, you know, if you're going to make positive statements, you know, don't pretend you're customers or somebody else, you know, make it, you know, with your name uh, underneath there. Now on Facebook, you know you can poke people, right? And one of the websites I visited said, if you're over the age of 16, don't poke people. Um, and also, um, they said to go easy on tagging people in photos as well. But you can untag yourself. So if someone's tagged you in a photo, you can actually go online and untag yourself. But then it's permanent. And, um, uh, and one, la I didn't, haven't talked much about texting, but it's the same kind of rules as using your cell phone. But um, how quickly do you have to respond to a text message? Uh, well, there is no rule for how quickly you have to respond. Um, and so, uh, generally, texting is for more urgent messages, and uh, you know, so that's up to the sender and the receiver. And the last little bit that I'll talk about briefly is I, I, on the use of Twitter. How many of you have Twitter accounts? It's not as popular as Facebook, but uh, it is good for some uses. And, um, you know, one of the things, it's, it's like a group text, right? You can text a whole group all at the same time. So the thing is, you want to make your texts on um, your tweets, I'm sorry, comprehensible. So you don't want to use a lot of the text uh, abbreviations that everybody may not understand. So you want to avoid the text speak so that people you know, will understand your tweets. Um, I know there's a thing where a lot of people will follow people on Twitter if um, they follow them. And I guess uh, there's a current thing that uh, some people will unfollow people if the people will not follow them back. So that doesn't seem to be very productive. If you want to uh, retweet something interesting, you should give credit to the originator of the tweet. Um, you know, how many characters in a tweet, maximum? 140, right? So if, uh, if you do a tweet that's 140 characters and people want to retweet it to other people, there won't be enough room. So you want to have a tweet that's less than 140 characters so when people retweet it to other people, the whole message will be tweeted to, to their group. Um, 
It's also okay on Twitter to follow your competitors and they can follow you on Twitter as well. Um, and it's also okay to share a link. Um, it's not okay to encourage people to gang up on someone or uh, to incite what they call a social media mob. Uh, and um, Twitters are, when you post on Twitter, they're public, unlike Facebook where you can have privacy and only send your Facebook messages or posts to certain people. On Twitter, it's public, so you have to be a, a little more careful when you're uh, sending messages out. So that is my presentation today on all the electronic media. Are there any questions? Well, thank you very much for coming today. I'll mention that next uh, Wednesday, we will have seminar number four, and it'll be on uh, interview and office etiquette. It's one of our graduates, Renee Dahl, who is a recruiter for Fletcher Allen Hospital in Burlington, and she'll have some great stories to tell you. So I hope you'll join us next week. Thanks for joining us, and we hope you'll have some refreshments before you leave. Thanks very much.